producer of 6,000 Waiting. What a moving film. That was fantastic. Andy Arias, the actor in Extra Special. Andy, he's coming on virtually. And Luke Terrell, also from Extra Special. They'll all be joining us virtually. And to moderate this conversation, we have Michael Perlmutter from the Cerebral Palsy Alliance Research Foundation, um, who can tell you a little bit more about what that means. Oh, good, everybody's here. Um, and Michael, I'll hand it over to you. Can we give these wonderful people another round of applause? So I didn't expect them to be as powerful as they were. Uh, I, don't, I don't know whether that was low expectations or what, but I, uh, I was absolutely blown away um, by the work that each and every one of you did. Um, and so I'm going to start uh, with Borderline Coffee, because that's where we started. So um, everything negative and positive in this film is written on a post-it note. And there's just so many of them, right? Um, and some of them, they're everywhere, but they're easy to put on, they're easy to take off. And so I'm just wondering um, some of the symbolism, why you chose post-it notes and, and why they are so easy to crumple up and throw in the trash can or to affix to your chest. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, I'm also really humbled to be in a lineup of such amazing uh, and powerful films. Um, so thank you all to the filmmakers. Um, uh, when writing it, I guess the first time I went through it, I imagined uh, an elaborate um, scavenger hunt um, that uh, had like gold notes and things. And I sent it to a friend and she was like, okay, now write the low budget version of that. I was like, okay, cool. Um, so that was an interesting challenge. And then I thought of actually my sister's room and all the post-it notes that she puts up around Elizabeth. Um, and uh, I thought that was an interesting way to externalize um, that character in our head, the judge, um, and through the colors, make it the positive and negative. Um, so was it really just a way of thinking how I could make the film at a certain budget, but then it became something that I recognized was so universal with the post-it notes. And I like what you said of easily taking them on or putting them on and taking them off um, because that's what our thoughts, um, if we can, we can, they easily come and we can just as easily take them off. Anything you wanna add, Jeff? But sometimes it's replaced with a worse thought, yeah. too, which is the thing, I know my personal experience with anxiety is the cycle there, even if you get the red one, blue one, red one, blue one, um, sometimes it's hard to stop the train, which is what, also spoke to me about uh, Susanna Short. Yeah, which is why I sent it to him. <laughs> um, just as a follow-up, the, the barista, I asked you about this when we were standing in the audience, the barista also has a post-it note on his head. He, you know, you, were, you told me a, a, an awesome story about how that came to be. Uh, yeah, I sent it to, um, I give credit to that to Scott Atzit, um, who is a, writer and may know him from 30 Rock, but he was very kind enough to send me uh, or to read the short when I sent it to him. Um, and he's like, you're missing something. Um, what about putting on a post-it note um, to the barista, opening up the world and uh, recognizing that um, the thoughts that we experience um, seem so personal and yet um, everyone around us has their own version of what those post-it notes are. Um, and so, yeah, that came, and should I have been an architect? I don't know, I literally have thought that, of should I have been an architect? So I just put that on somebody else's head. I was almost an architect. <laughs> you were, I, and Jeff was almost an architect. I, I didn't realize the specific profession had so much meaning to you. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I didn't either until right now. <laughs> until that moment. I also should have been a doctor, you know? I shouldn't have been a doctor, though. That shouldn't have happened. <laughs> Afraid of blood, but yeah. Um, well, thank you for that. It's absolutely an incredible film. And it was actually the first one that I saw um, when I was prepping for this. And to say it got out to an amazing start is an understatement. So thank you for the film and how wonderful it is. 
Um, I also want to ask some questions of Michael here. So um, 6,000 waiting has, uh, has a place in my heart because some of the work that we do at the Cerebral Palsy Alliance Research Foundation is to make access more real accessibly um, to the population of people with CP. And so I guess, how did you learn about this waiting list? Um, why did you decide to make a movie about it? And have there been any updates from the people that were in the movie since the movie happened? Yeah, thanks. Great questions. Hold on. So it was, Sorry. yeah. How'd you learn about the way I learned? Uh-huh. Okay, great. We'll start there. Yeah, I'm bad at like keeping all the things. In there. First off, yeah, just like you guys said, it was an amazing lineup of films. Uh, I'm just really honored to be with everyone. Um, it was actually like a layover in the Atlanta airport when I found out about it. Um, I was doing a docu-series called uh, As I Am, and it was like uh, doing a portrait piece on 12 different people with intellectual disabilities in 12 different countries. And I had a long layover, so I reached out to a friend and uh, he picked me up and he had just heard the news that they were cutting the amount of waivers that Georgia State was releasing uh, that year. And he was just beside himself. Um, so he started to talk more about it and, um, a dream was hatched. Um, so the film was one part of a larger project. And what we did is we started by getting over a hundred stories in the state of Georgia of people uh, who were on the waiting list and one from every voting district in Georgia. And we turned those into little pamphlets that we would use at the Capitol building. Um, then uh, we did this film, and then we did a podcast that went into the weeds on things. One thing people often say when they see this film is, I still don't really understand what Medicaid waivers are. <laughs> and that was actually, you know, kind of intentional. Um, we had a very small budget, uh, and we had a very small amount of time to make it. So you have to make your choices. And I thought, you know, the typical way to approach a film on Medicaid waivers is to talk to the experts uh, who could tell you what they are and who they're for and describe the system. A typical film maybe to approach uh, cerebral palsy would be to talk to medical professionals who could explain the diagnosis. Um, and what I really wanted to do with 6,000 Waiting was to um, ask, okay, which experts are we going to spend some time with, maybe uh, we'll ask the experts who are, their expertise is on the experience um, of living uh, on the waiting list, and in this case, living with cerebral palsy. So, uh, so I kind of wanted to go in through the back door rather than looking at as a health issue to think, you know, what's really at stake here? It's that you have a stack of papers with people's names on it and forms with yes and no boxes that are getting dusty. But what's really, really at stake is what Nick uh, Papadopoulos said. He's looking out his window in nursing home, and he's wondering, why am I here if I'm going to die in obscurity? And if he were to die in obscurity, like many people are doing, it's not because of the failure of his imagination, it's because of the failure of our imagination. So uh, I, I guess like that was kind of the vision behind uh, why we approached it the way we did. And, you know, in the disability world, there's this word uh, diagnostic overshadowing, you know, when someone gets introduced and it's instead of saying like, hey, this is Michael, it's like, hey, this is a guy with ADHD, right? Well, sometimes there's like informational overshadowing where we could get into the weeds and arguments about Medicaid and all the different waivers that are available. And I just wanted to cut through all that and be like, hey, this is about people, this is about humans, and they matter, and this is what they love, and this is what they live for, and this is what they stay awake at night terrified about. And from there, you know, I feel like we'll make better decisions if we're in touch with that. I mean, they so matter, right? That's, I mean, ultimately, that's, that's the point. They're real people. They're not, they're not numbers. They're not their insurance number. They're not their social security number. Um, and it just comes through so much during the film. Um, it, you know, I, I showed it to a person who I work with at the office who has CP. And to say that expletives came out of her mouth 
that we live in the richest country in the world and that there's still 800,000 people around the country on this waiting list um, would be an understatement about her reaction to your film. Um, so thank you for that. Also, you have much more productive layovers than I do. <laughs> I, I, it just occurred to me that I'm underachieving while I'm layover. <laughs> um, so, so let's, let's see some people and talk to some people who, who do it through humor. Um, and, um, and let's talk about extra special. So uh, I also wanted to thank uh, the folks at Extra Special, um, both Andy and Luke, for making such a, a wonderful film about authenticity and being your real self. Um, so there's so many play on words in this movie, and I appreciate each and every one of them. Uh, the name of the film, uh, the show that Ryan created, and, and how loaded special is as a word for the disability community in general. Um, so can you talk about, um, what a celebration of disability means to you, what this movie, sh what we should take from this movie and how, uh, you know, just wider involvement by people with specific dis disabilities like CP could make an impact on Hollywood at large. Cause I think that's, that's a little bit about what it's about. So Luke, do you want me to take that? Is that my question. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, I've been an actor for, in the industry and I work as a disability rights advocate nationally, um, but I've been an actor for 10 years. And it's very interesting how we sort of marginalize one person, right? You mentioned Ryan, who's a really good friend of mine and who loves the film, right? And we've been friends for a long time, but we often feel marginalized as you know, we're doing the one thing uh, for the disability community, that one show, right? Or that one series, and it has that disabled person. So we're good, we don't need to do anything more. And it's usually through a white lens, right? And I'm Latino and LGBTQ. And so when I would go to auditions, people would be like, oh, you're too extra, or you're too much, or your lifestyle is, your lifestyle is too um, a lot to deal with, you know, for Walmart commercials or for other things. So for like the better good of the last decade, this has like been the thing. And so, you know, I knew Luke's work and I knew how good he was about really taking authenticity and authentic voices and just putting them on screen. And I, flew to St. Louis and I was like, we need to do something. Um, we're actually in St. Louis now um, editing our new film uh, together. Uh, and so this is a, you know, for me being authentic, being real, being myself, being uh, one voice, because I'm one voice in a large community of disabled actors, of LGBTQ actors, of marginalized actors. I want there to be more. I want there to be many colors of the rainbow, regardless of disability, regardless of orientation, and regardless of your um, ethnicity. So thank you. And I'll just, I'll add to so, I actually come from a documentary background. Um, so this film was made for the Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge, which is something that Nick Novicki created several years ago. And it's been um, something that Andy and I have both participated in um, many years in a row. And that's what we're working on right now. And we wish we could be with you all, but that's we're working on the, the film challenge this weekend. But in, in my background in documentary, I think there's a lot, there's a long history of um, documentaries connected to disability that focus either on like overly inspiring stories or storytelling or, or like over medicalizing a condition. And I think we're, you know, there's a place for inspirational stories and medical understandings, but it's really fun. I think now, especially to be exploring um, stories that are, that are more peripherally connected to disability or that just incorporated in a more sort of seamless way. And so this was a challenge. Narrative is a challenge for me in general. Humor is a challenge. 
Um, Andy obviously made it a lot easier for the humor to come out because he's just such a funny uh, actor in general. And we had a lot of fun um, utilizing his improvisational skills in the film. But so I think uh, having a, a film that's connected to disability that has more subtle messaging was kind of the goal. And I, I feel good about how we accomplished that with Extra Special. Yeah, I mean, you did a phenomenal job. I'm, I'm, I, we have an, a nice size audience in the room here. And just based on the laughs, humor didn't seem to be a challenge. For you guys. <laughs> uh, Thank I, you, guys. I, I appreciate that. I wish I was there. <laughs> have, uh, you know, have you had toasted ravioli yet? That's like the really important. Oh, thing. you know what? I actually have not and probably will never again. That was the <laughs> most interesting texture in my mouth so um probably never again but i you know i'm i'm starting to love st louis so it's an interesting thing I, I, hope, I, hope they, I hope they provided better weather this time no no they did not we're actually filming right now and the second day i got here it started snowing so i was like okay nick you're one upping me you're one upping last year it's fine <laughs> Um, I, I can see as somebody who does not, ha, has no capability to make films, act in films, or doesn't have a 10th of the talent that you have in your pinky finger, um, what I get from this, but what do you want us to get from this? Like what ultimately, and I'd love to hear from each and every one of you, what, if, if the audience or other people who are watching it what would you love the one thing that they just grasped from your movie? And I'd love to hear it both from the people who made the movie and people who obviously starred in the movie. So let's start with, uh, with Jeff. Um, I think for this, you know, Susanna had initially sent it to me for notes and um, I, I'd done so much sketch comedy and things like that prior, um, but it had my own private mental health struggles for the most part. And it just resonated with me so much that I said, can we make this? Can we, <laughs> can we figure out a way to do it? And um, along the way, um, I just, and we had some conversations about this, but I had this idea that we could also find a way to show it at schools and also programs like this where um, kids who today are growing up much differently than we did, blasted with technology and self-criticism and anxiety um, could see something like this, I think get a little bit of entertainment out of it, like in a, in a humor sort of way, because I think Susanna does a great Charlie Chaplin-esque kind of performance while struggling with very real emotions. Um, anyway, I, I wanted to make it accessible and kind of um, digestible, I guess, in terms of the mental health struggles that people have that you might not know about. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. That was kind of a word salad. <laughs> um, uh, the title uh, Borderline Coffee comes from specifically borderline personality disorder, which is a diagnosis um, that I had. And um, you can actually um, treat um, and reduce the symptoms so you no longer have the diagnosis. So it's one of a um, uh, category in mental health that's um, not really talked about. And the borderline personality disorder is definitely a, a, a diagnosis that seems scary to a lot of people. They're like, oh, what does that mean? Um, and so I worked with, with actually um, my therapist as a consultant on this to make sure that I um, had all the points of what it means specifically to have borderline personality disorder um, in terms of self-harm, in terms of the thoughts, in terms of rumination. Um, and part of that says, well, it doesn't necessarily have to be about borderline or BPT, um, but to recognize that um, when people watch it, they're um, uh, connecting to it on a personal level, and that helps with destigmatizing mental illness um, and recognizing that everyone has those thoughts. It's amplified for some, um, but everyone has those thoughts. So I guess circling back to your question of what I want people to get from it is, is the, seeing the humanity and seeing a story that isn't about an amplified day. It's just kind of a regular day. Um, and those thoughts of like, you're lame is like, that can haunt someone. Um, so, and a 
I I love your film because it was a call to action in a way and hoping that uh, watching a film like this makes you reorient to what it means to have um, struggles with mental health um, and kind of look at others in a different way and um, a call to action to uh, how we can actually change the system. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, Michael, what I mean, I, I want to give want to make sure that they have an opportunity and the people on the internet have an opportunity. So in 100 words or less, <laughs> what, what I know that's challenging. Um, but what one message, what is the one thing that you want us to do? I mean, what can we do to, to, to help this? I've always been really troubled by um, the fact that, uh, you know, why certain people are disqualified from humanity or human community um, because of the bodies they're born into. Uh, the call to action is really just let's let's form community in new ways. Let's let's if we have the money, let's share it. <laughs> um, can't do it in hundred words. I want to get Nick out of the nursing home. You're like in the thirties. You're okay. <laughs> okay. I wanted to get Nick out of the nursing home. He was, he was supposed to come here. We we're really close to getting him here. Um, yeah, he, he, we, we got him a waiver though, like a few months ago. Yeah. So that was a fight. We, we finished this, we finished this movie, uh, like the editing of it. And then we had to wait for a while and stuff. And, but, uh, it was probably like, two years ago. It was the first time I'm seeing it on a big screen, but it was like two years ago, maybe. And then we've had a meeting every two weeks uh, with Nick, with our get Nick out <laughs> campaign to try to get him out. And a woman saw this and she decided to donate her land and donate a home to be built for him. Um, but he's, he's one, like we chose three of the 97 stories for this documentary, right? And those 97 were just some of the 6,000, those are just some of the 800,000. Uh, and so, uh, gosh, 100 words. But getting Nick out and then, you know, closing the gap on the waiting list, uh, we, there was a bill that was written after this film, Georgia Bill, uh, Senate Bill 208, signed by not enough people to make it to the floor. So it died. But we had a, you know, a rocket launch. I guess we want to overcome the waiting list. We want to get people back into their communities uh, if they choose, if that's what they want. Yeah. Thank you for that. And to mow their lawns naked if they want to. To, to mow their lawns naked. Extra special folks. What do you what do you say? What's the one thing that we should take away from your your wonderful and hilarious film? That I look at disability on a spectrum of life, right? So like I'm not disa I'm disabled today, but that doesn't mean anybody in the audience won't be disabled later. And so I celebrate in whatever moment I'm in. I'm in this disabled body, this wheelchair, this moment. But that doesn't mean you can't be fabulous, beautiful, amazing in whatever moment you are in. And I think that people at large don't look at disability that way. It's either like it's us or them. It's not all of us together. And I think that people need to start looking at it that way because one day you will be sitting in a wheelchair and you will be disabled and you wanna still have yourself and your beauty and your talent and your strength in that vessel, whatever that vessel looks like, right? Like. This whole idea of normal is kind of ridiculous, but we hold on to it and really want to, you know, strive for it. But you know, you can have beauty in any moment that you're in. Absolutely. I'll just say, uh, uh, I mean, one of the things um, for me that, like, a, a takeaway I want people to have is just that th there's been a lot of progress in bringing diversity into these entertainment spaces. I think disability a lot of times is still at the bottom of that list. I think there's just still a lot of progress to be had. And I'm excited to see new and creative ways um, 
to tell these kinds of stories. And I think we're just scratching the surface. And so I was excited for this to be a part of this movement of films that are thinking differently and, and approaching you know, subjects that are familiar to some, aren't familiar to others, but regardless, trying to rethink of ways to, to tell these types of stories. Yeah, absolutely. And such an important lesson. We interact with a lot of people in diversity, equity, and inclusion departments who don't even think of disability as part of their department. It's, it, it boggles my mind, actually, that, that they don't think of that kind of inclusion or that kind of equity. Are there questions from people in the room or on the internet? I've got plenty more if you don't have any. Hi, thanks. Thank you. Um, I have a question for uh, Borderline Coffee. As a writer, separate writer and director of what that process was like of you kind of handing over your writing, your story to a director and how he brought your vision to light or how he changed your vision and vice versa. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, I have never made a film before. Um, so really Jeff is the film person um, or he taught me a lot about how the process was like and he um, um, brought a lot of resources. I uh, wrote it um, I'm a theater actor and um, theater maker. Um, so we worked in tandem on the day um, in terms of uh, what was going on of like, can we shoot it this way? It was like, well, that doesn't quite work with the story. So it was, it was a lot of um, uh, collaboration in that regard. And um, his really amazing editing and um, directing brought brought my vision to life. So that was um, that was a really incredible thing. Anything you want to add? Um, I think what was really cool was that I trusted your performance. I mean, you were you wrote it for yourself. Yeah, you never yourself. seen me act before. But yeah, actually, yeah, I'd never seen you act before. <laughs> but um, so I got to spend the day, what did we, it was a day and a half. Mm -hmm. I got to spend that time focusing on the visuals and how to use the camera to get inside your head and how to figure out the choreography with you of the post-it notes and then I think we had this joint realization and then again in editing that we didn't need to read all of them mm -hmm. and so one of my favorite frames is the red post-it notes just surrounding you in the kitchen and by that point we get it we know we had cut out some stuff that was maybe over explaining, mm -hmm. but I felt like that was kind of the thesis of the script that you had handed me was this woman walking out into the dark, leaving all of that looming stuff behind. Um, so yeah, it was a very fun collaboration. Thank you for that question. I think we had one over here. Uh, it's for extra special. I wonder how much uh, of the script was improvised or did you stick to something that you had in advance? Because it looks so real, so. <laughs> Luke, I, I'll just mention something. So Luke and I met on another project that he was working on and I just loved his editing and he worked with a couple of friends of mine and. And I was like, it, he knows how to tell an authentic story. So a lot of it was improvisation, but we had we had a very direct sort of idea and script involved. Um, but I love to be in the moment of wherever I'm at. And Luke knows that. So he really gave me... Um, he really gave me a lot of space to be like, what would what would you say here if you were this kooky person? Um, and I'm not that kooky. A lot of people think I'm that. <laughs> Luke, calm down. Uh, that's like one aspect of my personality that I get to put on screen. But um, I'm actually a pretty serious person. But Luke knows that side of my character, so he was like, I'm gonna I'm gonna write this and put this for you and you make it, you know, what you would do with it. So that was a gift. 
Yeah, okay. I'll say. By the way, well, go, ahead. go ahead. No, you first. <laughs> um, I was just going to say. So last year, yeah, we had a we had a script. You know, I think I'm actually pretty horrific when it comes to like narrative filmmaking, and this because it was mockumentary style, it somehow worked out, and I got to utilize my my documentary skill set, um, which I feel a lot more comfortable with, and so you know, asking interview questions and bouncing that off of somebody it just came more naturally. And then the dynamic that Andy and I had was really just working. And so in the edit room, it turned out that a lot of the best takes were the ones that were more improvised. So this year, the film that we just shot, we had no script. Um, we, we had a, a much looser, you know, idea of what the story was going to be. And then I just kind of would throw Andy into situations and, and let him play off of his environment. No script for a movie. I can't wait to see that one, Andy. It, it, you know what? It's it. I have to say, Luke and I are editing it now, but I am very excited about this. And I will be. I'll. I'll give a little tell about extra special. I was extremely nervous on how the disability community would take it, and how my friend Ryan would take it. Right, because we're really ripping on the idea that Hollywood marginalizes marginalizes one character for for uh disability and diversity and so i was like oh i don't know i'm i'm nervous there are a lot of pieces that i was like ah but now i completely trust luke so if he told me to jump off a bridge it's gonna look amazing <laughs> i probably would do it and be okay with that i don't know how to follow that <laughs> um are there questions from the internet at this point no so are Oh, are we done? I, I, I'll uh, just one last question for 6,000 waiting, just to make it fair. I had the question just, just you know, you, you use film as a tool for social change in such a beautiful way. How are you getting this film out there? Where's the film going? And can we help? Yeah, I mean, can we help? <laughs> yeah, well, this is helping, right? You've spent, all of you have spent your time on, on a weekend. Uh, to listen to the stories of these individuals who, you know, before we brought a camera into the room and we snuck it into the nursing home initially, we had to pay the, the CA uh, and bring her along um, because, you know, they weren't, they weren't happy about it at all. Um, uh, yeah, you, you've heard these stories. That's, that's a victory in itself. Um, you know, to be vulnerable, I worked as a, as I started off as a ghostwriter, made my way into film, became a director. And it was this film that made me become a producer because we weren't able to get it out there. And it was just like killing our team, but it just wasn't working with the producers that we were working with. So, uh, so I was like, okay, I got to learn how to be a producer so we can figure out how to get this stuff out there. Um, so I, I guess I don't know the 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 state of New York. I haven't studied its situation, but I would say the more we pressure, I mean that that story of the mothers in Georgia, there there was no archival footage of it. That's why we had to learn stop motion and like do that. I locked myself in a room for twenty two hours and came out and was like, I got the solution. Um, but no coverage of it. But it was these three moms who changed the game. Uh, so like like Ben said. Uh, you know, you never doubt a Southern mama. And I'm sure it would be the same. My, my whole dad's side of the family grew up in New York. So I would never doubt a New York woman either <laughs> or man. So yeah, I, I don't know, but I, I just, I'm really grateful. And I know everyone on my team and in, everyone in the cast is incredibly grateful that you guys saw the importance in these stories and that you gave it the dignity of this theater and of your time. So very grateful for that. All of the films here today are so fantastic. Everyone should be seeing these films. Tell all your friends. They're, they're available everywhere in the U.S. this week virtually. Um, you don't only have to come to the, to the JCC to see these films, um, but watch them um, this week through Real Abilities, and you don't have to have a, or realize that you have a disability connection to appreciate these amazing films. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Michael, for moderating this.
Thank you all for coming. There's much, much more. We still have two more films here tonight um, coming up. Um, our next film here at 6.30 is Amazing Grace. Um, don't miss that. Grace Fisher will be here with us. Um, and uh, then that's followed by The Blind Man Who Did Not Want to See Titanic, which is a fantastic narrative. Um, and of course, tomorrow, another full day of films. Tell your friends. Thank you so much. Have a good night.